Hi, I'm James Naylor Green, Professor of Brazilian History and Culture at Brown University and the National Co-Coordinator for the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. This program is part of the Democracy Observatory and is supported by the Washington Brazil Office. This is Brazil Unfiltered. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Marcia Lima to our program. Marcy is a professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Sao Paulo and a technical advisor to the Dean of Inclusion and Belonging uh, at the university. She is the coordinator of Afro Research Center on Race, Gender, and Racial Justice at the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning, which is known as SEBRAPI. She has a PhD in sociology from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and has a postdoctoral fellowship from the University of Columbia and was a visiting fellow at the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at Harvard University. She's a member of the Brazilian Society of Sociology, the Latin American Studies Association, and the Brazilian Studies Association. She has researched and published in the areas of racial inequality, gender and race, and affirmative action. Marcia, welcome to Brazil Unfiltered. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, for this invitation. I'm really happy to be here with you. Great. Marcia, could you tell us a little bit about your research? What are you working on currently? Uh, I have investigated race and gender inequalities, especially in the labor market and education throughout my career. But recently, in the last 15 years, maybe, I focused my research agenda on affirmative action policies in Brazil, especially the public policies to access the higher education. Um, I've already studied the ProUni, the University for All. It's a very important program to private higher education system. And currently I'm working with Luiz Augusto Campos from UERJ, Rio de Janeiro, in a huge research about the two decades of affirmative action policy and we have a consortium with seven Brazilian universities. And we're trying to figure out the achievements and also the challenges for this policy for the future. It's thinking more about the future than the past. So when we want to evaluate the, what's happened until now, but our goals is, are to figure out how you can improve the Could you maybe policies. tell our listeners a little about the history of how affirmative action was actually implemented in Brazil? Yeah, that's a very curious uh, because uh, everybody talks about the law, the law, uh, the quotas law that people say. Says. But uh, the quotas law uh, in this year, 2022, completes 10 years of the law. But the affirmative action policy in Brazil completes in the same year, 20 years. So we have two moments for this, uh, uh, to understand the, the affirmative action in Brazil. The first decade, we don't have a law, a federal law, to implement the policy in all federal universities, for example, like we have now. But when the law was created in 2012, 86% of the public universities in Brazil already implemented the affirmative action. So the law is important to understand what's happening now and the law create uh, the same way for the every Brazilian university, federal university to implement this policy, but we have uh, uh, different experience from different universities before the law. And this previous experience was very, very important to, to create the, the law. So the law is a result of 10 years of experience trying to, to apply for the inclusion, social inclusion, the racial inclusion, in different Brazilian universities. So. so for our listener who might not know about the Brazilian educational system, the best universities in Brazil um, are, with one or two exceptions, are the federally funded government organizations. There's one or two state universities which are particularly good as well in the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, tuition is free for undergraduate and graduate programs. And so in the past, historically, middle class and upper middle class and upper class kids 
would uh, go to private schools for high school to prepare to pass the entrance exam to get into the free universities. Whereas people from low income, especially people of Afro descent or people of indigenous origins, really went to public schools, which weren't as good, and therefore it was harder for them to get into the university. So the system that was established 20 years ago tried to break down that kind of implicit structural racial barrier between white upper class privileged people in general, though there were exceptions, and uh, the large number of people who are of African and indigenous descent. So that kind of started in in the government of Fernando Enrique Cardoso in the Ministry of Foreign Relations when he implemented an affirmative action program to get into the school uh, to prepare for the uh, the career in, in, in dipl diplomacy. But it really, it really got, got underway during the governments of of the Workers' Party after Lula. What 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 is what is is there a relationship between the Workers' Party coming to power and the expansion of the affirmative action programs? And if if there is, so could you talk about that? Yes, I believe there is a, a connection, especially because the the affirmative action policies are, I think the most important demand from Black Movement Brazil. And this demand started up decades ago. And so uh, I have a concern to, to, to say that because affirmative action, the policy quotas policies, they're not a, a, a Lula's idea or a PT idea, but the PT's government was very important to implement this policy considering the, the, the participation of the black movement inside the parties and inside the government. So it's very crucial to understand this process. And another thing I think is important to, to, to emphasize is the Brazilian, the higher education system in Brazil is mostly private. So, when we talk about the 85% of uh, the enrollments in higher education system in Brazil are, are in the private system. So that uh, you talk, when you said about the, the Brazilian system and the breakdown about the public, the, the affirmative action, in my opinion, this, the most important breakdown are in, uh, is in the public system because they are small, smaller than the private system and the, the, the public system is much better in terms of the qualification and uh, in terms of resource to research and another. That's the three ideas about uh, research, teaching and extension, for example, the idea of university. Uh, and they have the better, the better formation than private universities. So I think that's one of the reasons the debate about affirmative action policies to the public universities was so hard and so tensions in Brazil because it's a very, very important part of the Brazilian elite space. It's a completely white space and rich space. And these policies has, have changed completely the profile of the university students in Brazil. So the tension about this very special portion of access to higher education in Brazil. Nobody cares about affirmative action in the private system. The problem with affirmative action in the public system because this system represents the Brazilian elite. Right. And, and I, I, you know, I studied at the University of Sao Paulo in the late 70s in the social sciences where you you teach now in sociology. And it, I can, it was very, very white. It was very much middle class. There were a few people from poor backgrounds, working class backgrounds, but it was mostly middle and upper class kids who had gone to private high schools to pass the exams to get into the university. So the law schools, the medical schools, the good schools, the engineering schools traditionally have been part of the white elite and their children and the idea of reproducing class relations and racial relations in that way. So how, did the, how does a quota system work exactly? So that, again, for our listeners who might not know that, 
what does the federal law uh, provide in terms of the enrollments of students in the in the in the public schools, public universities? The federal law um, reserves fifty percent of the oldest enrollment to stud students from a public system in Brazil. Uh, a student uh, who attends the high school in the public system because the, the high school public system in Brazil, it's for the poor people, the black people and the private high school system for the rich people, uh, as you said before. And within this 50% of uh, seats for public high school students, we have a proportion for white poor people and a proportion for black poor people. So we don't have a racial quotas in Brazil. The racial quotas actually is a sub quota. It's a part of the quota is for black people and indigenous people. And, and this, proportional, this proportion is the proportion of the black and indigenous people in each state in Brazil. For example, in Sao Paulo, 35% of the, 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 the population is black and indigenous. So within this 50%, we reserve 35% for the, the black people. <clears throat> and that's the, 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 the way the, the, the law works. So there is no racial quotas only, but the idea is to guarantee uh, a representation of the black and the, the black poor people and the white poor people uh, inside this reservation. So, so that would mean, in fact, that would mean, in fact, that a, a person who is of European background but from a poor family could also be a part of this fifty percent if they had gone to a public school. So it's very different from other constructions of the notion of affirmative action in other countries in that regard. Uh -huh. So um, the other thing that is notable since the beginning of the 21st century, and it overlaps with the Workers' Party although in the government, although I don't think I like affirmative action, there's not necessarily a direct causation, there's sort of an overlap, is change in racial identity. Whereas... Um, when I lived in Brazil in the 70s and I knew people in the, in the, the Black United Movement, Movimento Negro Unificado, it was, a, it was a movement that was going against the current in the sense that most people didn't embrace uh, a notion if one has some African uh, heritage, then one can identify as Black, even though their skin color might be light. And that has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. Could you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. First, I'd like to, to state that racial classification does not work as synonymous of the racial identity. I think there is different thing when we talk about uh, uh, racial composition and racial identity in Brazil. Um, racial classification or, or racial composition is based on official data about IBGE from uh, Brazilian uh, statistics official office in Brazil um, and national statistics. And we, we in these categories are color like black, brown, white, yellow, and indigenous. And racial identity is about other things. It's about how can I identify myself with the black population situation and if I face or not racism in the, my everyday life, and if I wanted to construct my racial identity as a political thing. But uh, it's curious because both the racial classification, the racial composition have changed in Brazil. For example, between 2000 and 2010, according to, according to official statistics, Brazil officially became a black country in this, the, the first decade of this, this century. In 2000, we had 45% of Brazilians declared themselves as a black and indigenous. In 2010, uh, this proportion increased to 51.3%. So it's official, 
in 21st century Brazil became a black country. And and this is but this is using the classification of of negro y pardo that uh, that is of black and people who yeah. pardo is a hard term to translate I always find difficulty but how do you translate pardo when you do it um, if I'm brown I, I explain the the idea of color to demographic way to classify people by color and it's okay use the black brown and indigenous and uh, the problem is we can use Negro in English. Né? It's very complicated right. to translate it Negro right. to Negro. So you translate black and brown as a black. Right. So when you get the black and brown and you call black, it doesn't make sense maybe, but that's the only way you have to, to use these categories when you're trying to translate because it's impossible to use the, the, work, the word Negro in, in English. So... So when you put together black and brown in Brazil, we have 51.3% of the our Brazilian population classified themselves as black or pardo. Yeah. But when we discuss racial identity, I think we are mobilizing and building a political and a historical identity. So, so that means that a person might be very light-skinned and 30 years ago might have not said I'm black but today would understand about their racial heritage, their history of in their ancestors of slavery and discrimination and structural racism, and therefore identify culturally, politically as black today. Whereas maybe 20 or 30 years ago, their mother or their father might not have, have had that identification. I think the most changing about the racial identity in Brazil is nowadays people has proud to the black, has proud to, to looking for your roots, find your roots like Skip Gates. And, and people, people have more proud to be black in Brazil. I think that's an amazing transformation. And this amazing transformation for me, in my opinion, my interpretation is very connected with the black youth population and it's connected to the change to access to higher education. And a lot of changes you have recently in Brazil, in the world, uh, the social media we're going to talk about later. But uh, for me, I, I'm, 20, I'm 51 years old. And when I was a kid, to be black was so embarrassing to talk about race in the schools to talk about race in my family and the, the idea to be discriminated by races. I can't talk about it. We feel that we have this, this feeling. We had this feeling when, when I was a child, my generation had the feeling about racism, about discrimination, racial discrimination, but we never talk about it at home or at the schools. My nephews, they talk about race all the time. They have 13, 13 years old, 15 years old, and they, they have a narrative about races. I didn't have this opportunity when I was a young so That's a huge transformation about to be black in Brazil, is to be proud to be black in Brazil. I think that's, I remember when they, we have the census in 1990s, we have a campaign and the initiative about don't let your color be blank. Uh, uh, we have a black movement campaign to people declare themselves black. It was very, wasn't, that a, wasn't that a play on words? I imagine it was no dash to sell cor sell in branco. Yes. To leave it in, in, in blank, but also in Portuguese, that means white. So there was a kind of a play of words there. But you know, I mean, when I teach the history of Brazil, the history of race in Brazil, I emphasize a lot the, um, the contradictions of the ideas of the sociologist Gilberto Freire, who on one hand was developing a discourse in the 30s against scientific racism with uh, a reading of Brazilian history as being one of the European, the African, and the indigenous, and the mixture of these three races created a nation, a people, and uh, it, it silenced any criticism of structural racism that existed in Brazil because the national narrative that everyone was to be proud of was 
we're a blending of these three wonderful races. We all contribute different things, but they're important for what Brazilian is a culture, whether it's samba or feijoada for black people or uh, things that indigenous people contribute to the country, the Europeans. And that, I think that was one of the biggest challenges of the Black United Movement in the 70s and beyond, which was to kind of deconstruct that very strong national narrative that, that Brazilians have. It's much like the American narrative of democracy. Americans truly profoundly in their hearts believe we are the best democracy in the world. And if you question that in any way, they're they're offended because it just strikes against everything they've learned since first grade. Is, is that Does that ring true to you? How does the narrative of, of Gilberto Freire that was also reinforced by Getulio Vargas in the 30s and 40s, how did that permeate and affect society, even affect you growing up indirectly? It's, it's curious because it's a kind of misunderstanding. You know, you look at the world and said, I can't see what these people are writing about Brazil, but I was a teenager, like I, I, I couldn't have a tools to, to deal with this, but I always said there is something wrong in this interpretation because <laughs> I, I look at the world, I look at the Brazil, and I can't see this so harmonious, so, you know, it's, uh, and, but it's interesting because the, the this, this interpretation was so powerful. I remember when I was working my PhD dissertation, I interviewed a lot of black uh, professionals and I always asked about the racial discrimination experience. And uh, in the beginning of the interview, I always asked, have you experienced any racial discrimination in your career? No, never. Half, 30 minutes later, they are talking about the most racist experience I've ever heard. Okay, uh, I lost my job because there were, they, they, they must to, to, to hire someone, to, to, to fire someone. And I was the only black, so I lost my job. Okay, there is no racial discrimination in your life. So it's very interesting because in, in the, the first reaction, was no, I, I have experienced this in my career. I have never, I never experienced this. But we talk about it for a lot of things, and they start. I, I, I remember that they start to realize how this experience was a racism. So I think the first reaction is no, but when you start, when you keep working on this, this, this conversation. It's always show up some hard and terrible experience to be black, especially for the women, the black in the labor market. So it, today we're facing in Brazil, the Bolsonaro government came to power uh, three and a half years ago, almost four years ago, and really deep in the polarization of the country, uh, uh, creating tremendous hostility towards ideas of the black movement, uh, ideas of quotas and affirmative action and all these kinds of things. How, what is that? What has been the effect in your assessment of Bolsonaro on, on the lives of Black people in Brazil? So we have a curious scenario um, considering the Bolsonaro and racism in Brazil because the Bolsonaro election was a backlash to our, our transformation about race, gender, etc. But they strengthened the anti-racism research and the anti-racism agenda is a reaction of a Bolsonaro government. So <laughs> the first moment you have a reaction or the, the, the inclusion narrative, and now you have a reaction to Bolsonaro's government. So that's the reason this next, this next election, are, the next election is so important for us. Yeah. So the polarization produce more hate, more, uh, the rate speech in Brazil now it's, unbelievable, but also have more mobilization against racism, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I, when I came to Brazil in the 70s, having been involved in the civil rights movement as a young kid and coming to Brazil, being a part of the left, I was shocked at the fact that the left didn't talk about race. It just didn't make sense to me. And today, when you watch people who are talking about the current government, they're very clear. This is a government which is 
racist, sexist, misogynist, homophobic, anti-environment. And all of those questions are very clearly articulated as part of an understanding by everyone about the current government. The big question, of course, is if he is not reelected and another government comes to power, whether these issues will be able to be addressed in a very serious way. So let me talk about that. Historically, there was an attempt in the 30s to establish through the Black Front a political party, but it never was successful. There never was a Black political party. The vehicle of autonomous social movements was one of the ways in which people articulated their uh, demands, their concerns, their ideas. What is your strat? What? How do you see as a strategy today for the Black movement to really articulate its concerns and demands uh, on Brazilian society? Okay, I believe the Bolsonaro government, which claims there is no racism in Brazil, has a regress regressive agenda on the racial agenda. We can't say Bolsonaro doesn't have agenda about race in Brazil. He has a regressive one. For example, and the racial violence, the, the police brutality, and Bolsonaro tries all the time to improve the police brutality all the time. So it's about race in Brazil. No? So just to understand that, you're saying that his policies encourage violence towards the black population and, and what would be some of the ex that's through the his uh, emphasis on the arms or having people having guns and impunity of the police when they're going into communities uh, when people are killed indiscriminately as they're allegedly trying to go against drug lords or against cr criminals Th those are the things you're referring to in terms yeah. of his policies exactly. The, the, the policy against indigenous people, against quilombolas, the debate about the access to, to land, all these questions about race, all these questions are, are about race. So, and that is a regressive policy to racial issues in Brazil now. And the race is, uh, we, if you look at the, the data, the data about racial inequalities in Brazil, and you pick the first decade in this century, we have a, a huge decrease of the racial inequality. The racial inequality started to increase again in 2014, and making uh, and during the COVID and after COVID-19. After there's no after COVID yet, but the the racial the racial inequality became huge again. The difference between black and white in Brazil. So the effect of the the public policies. And on the racial inequality, Brazil is huge. Black population in Brazil needs uh, needs public policy, and this pub, this policy must discuss race. So Bolsonaro, in attempt in a last minute attempt to win the election, has increased the uh, stipend that families are getting um, um, twenty dollars. Twenty or thirty dollars a month more. It's not a large amount of money, but it is a significant amount of money for poor people. And the majority of people in Brazil are very poor or extremely poor. Um, do you think that's going to have an effect on the elections at this point? Uh, could that turn the elections in his favor? Maybe a little, maybe a little effect, but I, I think they he can't change the his situation with this, because 70% of the, the people who who needs to social uh, uh, benefits, like uh, this, this new one, uh, we, during the pandemic, we, we call emergency assistance, uh, but now there is a new name, the Brazilian, Brazil, Brazil. Yeah. Brazilian help or assistance, yeah. 70% yeah. of this, this population is black. The poverty is black in Brazil. Every, everybody knows about that. But oh, but the same time, the 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 some research about uh, uh, elections, the black people and the women don't support Bolsonaro. So 
So I they might that. be happy to get the money, but they see through it as an electoral uh, maneuver in order to kind of get votes at the last minute. Maybe in São Paulo state, maybe definitely in Rio de Janeiro state because of the militia and everything else. Uh, the impact of this money is you'll be bigger than on other states, for example. I think uh, they can't impact the northeastern Brazil, for example. They don't vote for Bolsonaro. That's very impressive. The, the resistance to the northeast people to, to vote for Bolsonaro is, is since the first election. Mar Marcia, you've, you've taught about race in the United States and in Brazil. I'd be curious to hear your experience about doing that in two different countries. Yeah, after, I, I, never, I always have contact with the, I have a lot of experience with American students, but I never teach. Okay. The, but uh, I want to teach. <laughs> That's what I think I want to do soon is teach in the American universities. And I have the privilege to, to visit the most important university in the USA, like Columbia, Harvard, Brown, invited by you. And I think uh, I can talk a little bit about it considering my count because I always talk a lot with students in the United States. And actually they, uh, it's very curious because uh, the Brazil, the American students, when they visit Brazil, they, they, they couldn't see black students and black professors. So I'm a kind of, oh, wow, there is a black professor in Brazil. <laughs> uh, but I, I think uh, the reality is very different because, uh, you know, uh, the quality of the university, the structure of the university in the United States is very different. But, I think I can describe how, how the black students in Brazilian university has totally changed recently. And, and so now I can see in Brazil something I've already seen in the United States. So I, I, I've been in the United States since 1906. My first visit to an American University in the 90s, 1997. So in 1997, there is no black students in Brazil in university. So for me, the, it was a shock. I said, wow, they are black students in the university here and the good ones. So it's a, a um, if, so it's different when you compare the Brazilian experience now and in the, the past, and look at the United States. Do you know what I mean? I think it's different for us. Look at the Brazilian University and the American University today and 30 years ago. Uh, um, and why, when I received black American students here in Brazil, they were shocked about the, number, the low number of the, the, I think they have expectation, I'm going to Brazil, I'm a black student, I'm going to Brazil, to the to university, I'm going to talk to black people. And they don't talk, and they didn't talk about with black people because there is no black people in the past. Um, so I think that's for me is my first impression about the experience, university experience in the United States and Brazil. But also, if you consider now uh, uh, the 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 public policies to access higher education, in Brazil, it's now is bigger than the United States. Right. Yeah. In fact, so, in the United States, it's possible that, that the Supreme Court will reverse many of the programs in the next, uh, the next year, the next sessions of the Supreme Court in the United States. So Brazil is going to be the model for uh, inclusion in the future, it seems to me, if things go the right way. But I think in the United States, you have more... Uh, the debate about race in the classroom, class, classrooms, for example, in, in the teaching courses, um, it's much more consolidated than here. So, uh, for example, when I was in Harvard with Professor Gates, I attended his class about introduction to African-American studies, for example. We don't have nothing like that in Brazil until today. Yeah. But these new students, they demand, they asking for 
we want to read black authors, we want to discuss about racial inequality. We can't talk more about in Brazilian social thought without talking about black schoolers. And I think this, the next 10 years, uh, maybe it will be the most transformation in Brazilian university about race. It's not only the presence of the black student, but also the presence of the black professors. We are very, very, very small group in Brazil. And they want to talk about race and about race and about gender. And the Brazilian universities definitely will be turned more in the next 10 years, uh, considering the how we offer courses and debate about race inside the university, I think. It, because it's, it's very important because in my opinion, there is a problem here. Um, I think it's not a Brazilian problem. I think it's about the, this question is about a, a generation. The young students now, they want to talk about themselves, about their experience, about how they live in, in, your, in your community, in your neighborhood. And they have a kind of resistance to, for example, to read the Gilberto Freire, Nina Rodriguez, or other authors. They don't agree, for example. And I insisted with my students, we need you must read these guys, you know, you can, I, I want to just read about uh, um, racial inequality, racial matters, but I want to agree with other authors, or <laughs> there's no way you, you, you become an intellectual or a social scientist, for example, if you don't, if you don't read someone, you don't agree, you know, like I think that's, but I think it's more, Maybe in the United States the same. They have a, a reaction about the kind of interpretation about Brazil, and maybe the same in the United States. You you also run the risk of students saying, "I'm offended by what is written, therefore I refuse to read it because it upsets me, and therefore I won't read it." It always strikes me as strange because if you have a criticism of a way of thinking, the best way to criticize it is to understand it, to take it apart, and then. You can articulate the problems you have with it as opposed to, well, I didn't read it, but I've heard this, what they've said. So it's the challenge of all teachers everywhere. So, but I think social media has played a very powerful role in these changes that have gone on. I'm thinking about the ways in which uh, the social media has facilitated the arrival of new ideas and, and news about what's happening in other countries. And it's, it's in a way, I think, uh, influenced the way race has been constructed in Brazil. What, what do you see as the role of the United States in that process? Um, I think social media has revolutionized for the better and for the worse. The, the, the political dynamics in Brazil, especially about race. And, but I think it's not only in Brazil, it's everywhere. Yeah. Now we have more access to information and we can expand our tools to political transformation, to political mobilization. But, but we still have the fake news and it's highly dangerous for democracy. The, the impact of the United States, I think you can talk about George Floyd. When you talk about black, about media, about United States, about change in Brazil, you need to talk about uh, um, the George Floyd's death reaction. So, uh, while the reaction to George Floyd's death against the racism yeah, is in every place in the world. Um, but I think for the Brazilian experience was very important, the reaction to the George Floyd death. When you have our own George Floyd, for example, the Battle Freitas murder in Carrefour in Porto Alegre, I believe that the the international repercussion about this death is, is about social media and is about George Floyd. You have a before and after George Floyd and in the world, and this before and after about George, uh, uh, this before and after George Floyd's murder is about social media, is about how you can reach people now and can mobilize people now 
to participate in, in, in protests and you can create international agenda against racism or or the questions like gender and homophobia, you know. So we have an international articulation about uh, uh, to fight to, to fight racism. It's very important. I think you know Professor Michael Hanchard of the Department of African Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. He recently published research saying that blacks in Brazil have much more radical potential than in the United States. Uh, any thoughts about his uh, his comments? Yeah. Michael Hurst is a great, great friend of mine. And uh, I think this interpretation depends on how we define radical potential and for what. I, I, I read the news about the, when the, the interview when he said that and I couldn't identify specifically what's this kind of potential he's talking about. But I, I think Brazil is a black country and the first radical potential we have, it's, we have this potential because we are a black country. And we can't deny the importance of the Brazil changes, Brazilian transformation to Latin America, for example. There is, I think, the second rich, red, radical potential we can, we can think about. Uh, if you look at the how the public policy in Brazil impact the region, all the region, especially Colombia and, and other countries in the region uh, uh, to create uh, racial equality programs, it's huge. So there is no debate about Afro-Latin American studies without Brazil. And so we have this, this potential to, to make our policies, to make our policies important to the Latin America. Yeah. And so we have a very political empowered black youth uh, do with these changes we were talking about all the time that and I think this is the, that's the potential maybe Mike is talking about. And uh, this black youth in Brazil now is very potential. And Brazil can lead the Latin America to, to face this uh, all this political system and the racism and systemic racism in, in, in the region. Uh, the recent elections in Latin America are very, very important in Brazil now, you can turn to the left again. Chile and, and, and the other countries, uh, the election, the other countries now, it's very important what ha what's happening in Latin America. And if you, if you, we, take Bolsonaro off, I think you have a, a, a new configuration about, a new political configuration in the Latin American region, considering, uh, especially the debate about race. Great, Any, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I really do think that the changes in university policies have created a new generation of young people who are going to have a, a, an effect over the years as they go on to get masters and PhDs and start getting teaching positions. I think it's gonna have a real influence on the country as a whole, I agree with you. It's creating a generation of black scholars, of black intellectuals that is gonna be very important. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us today before we finish the program? I think we have, uh, I'd like to stress out some, some questions. The first one is about the elections, Brazilian elections this, this year. We are living, I think, the most important moment in for the Brazilian democracy. Um, I'm very concerned about it. And I think this election will define what kind of country we will have for the future. And also, in four years, we have seen how a government managed to destroy a democratic values. And the next four years must to to take, to take another direction. So I think that this point is very, very important. And the participation of the black movement and uh, um, in the left Paris in this process is, is crucial. Uh, we have some movement in Brazil, some initiative from black, black movement the first one was um, the name of that. I forgot the name. 
we have the, the, the initiative, as long as there is racism, there will be no democracy. This campaign uh, during the COVID pandemic, it was very, very important to, to debate, to create a, a more qualified debate about race in Brazil. And the connection between racism and democracy was a very strong connection, a very powerful campaign to face both racism and no democracy movements. Yeah? And now, uh, now there is a new movement from the Black Coalition for Rights, uh, Coalition Negra por Direitos, and the Quilombo in the Parliament. I think this movement they try they support more than 100 pre-candidates candidates from from the Black movement uh, during this ne next election. So it's much more. Um, it's much more important, in my opinion, to create this debate about race in different parties, especially the left ones, because the, 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 right, the right parties, they have more black candidates than the last, in the last election. Black, uh, right parties had more black candidates than the left ones. So, it was and we need to change this. I think this election also is important to consolidate the the racial issue in the left parties in Brazil. They, they they can't they can't move more without uh, consolidate the racial agenda in the parties in Brazil. I think that's very very important. So this election is about democracy. This election is more than other elections. This election is about race and racism in Brazil more than other elections. And it's a huge challenge for us to, to understand this process. So as a social scientist, we're trying to understand some process and in Brazil, some process is hard to understand. But I think that's my final remarks about the political, racial political question in Brazil. We need to we need to take Bolsonaro down and start almost from scratch to reconstruct this country. Marcia, I want to thank you so much for coming and joining us on Brazil on Filter Today. I know if you've been struggling against a really bad cold, and it's been really difficult over the last couple of weeks to get through it. Fortunately, uh, it seems to be it's gone, and so you're in a better place than you were. Um, Thank you, Jim. So to my listeners, I hope you all enjoyed the interview. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the video. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It helps other people find the program. Have a great week. Until next time, até a próxima. 